Well, good morning, good morning. and welcome to the uh, adult Sunday school class, Believer's Chapel, Dallas, Texas. This is Super Sunday. <laughs> you came at the right place at the right time. What can I say? Uh, Proverbs chapter 27. I will read those Proverbs that we have this morning, and then I want to... Uh, I want to spend a moment in prayer for the Newman family. I was with Mark yesterday. Dan and I went to the hospital and went back to uh, Stanton's room in ICU, and Dan prayed, and uh, it was an important time. So here we are, uh, Proverbs chapter 27. <coughs> Beginning in verse 2, and we will conclude at verse 14, Lord willing, this morning. Let a stranger and not your own mouth praise you, an outsider and not your own lips. Uh, the weight of a stone and the burden of sand. Now, you may not have that phrase in your translation, the burden of sand, but let me assure you it's there. And I'm going to give you the, the word that is used from the Old Testament. The weight of the stone and the burden of sand, but the vexation of a fool is heavier than both. For cruelty of wrath and the torrents. Now, you may not have the word torrents in your translation, Believe me, it's there. Uh, it's translated that way in the New King James. So, the cruelty of wrath and the torrents of anger, but who can stand before jealousy? And then verse 5, open rebuke is better than concealed love. 6, the wounds of a friend are faithful, but the kisses of an enemy are excessive. And you may not have the word excessive in your translation, but it's there, and I will show you where the word is used. Uh, verses 7 and 8 we're going to skip. We have had similar proverbs to that. And this one is particularly interesting. Verse 9. Olive oil and incense make the heart glad, and the sweetness of one's friend comes from passionate counsel. Passionate counsel. And finally, we'll finish by skipping verses 10 through 13 and going to our final proverb this morning, verse 14. For the one who blesses his neighbor with a loud voice early in the morning, it will be reckoned to him as a curse. Remember coming across that? I was very much surprised at really what that proverb is all about. It's an interpretive question. Well, let's uh, bow before the Lord of the Word and pray for Mark and Cindy and family. Uh, so grateful, Lord, to be here together under the Word of God, hearing the Scriptures again as we do under the leadership of these elders at Believer's Chapel. So grateful to be here. So grateful that our friend Warren is back with us to demonstrate his leadership to the class and Thank you for the life of his mother and for her testimony. And we're so grateful for the son that she raised and the contribution that he makes to all of us. And Father, we would certainly in our class want to remember the man who puts this class together for us, Mark, Cindy, and for the family. I ask your blessing upon them today, your peace, which surpasses all understanding. 
normal comprehension, that you would guard their hearts and minds in Christ during this very difficult days of providence, a dark providence that you brought that's impossible for them to have missed, that you have brought Stanton into this world and you are the one who superintends his day-to-day, -day, the breath that he takes, the beat of his heart. You alone are the sustainer, just as you are to all of us. Every breath we have is measured by you and you alone. And so, when we come to an ICU unit, we're again physically made acutely aware that it is not the machinery nor the wisdom of medical schools, but it is the grace of God that keeps us all alive, each and every one of us. And so we would pray this morning that this dark providence would end today, that this would be the day that Stanton would be able to come back, full consciousness, revive strength, and that he would again, uh, as Mark said to me, I want to see my son walk out of this hospital. Would you, in your grace today, make that a truth and a reality? We pray that for him. And as his friends and as his students in this class we lift up hearts and minds in unison praying to that end asking your grace and blessing always for you are the initiator and the sustainer of all life and we ask it in jesus name amen uh, let a stranger and not your own mouth praise you. Uh, let's begin by looking at the proverb by noticing the parallels. You know, the parallels really help us to interpret and to see the proverb because you get a word in line one and it's redefined for you to some extent in line two. So here is are parallels. Notice stranger matches outsider. Mouth matches lips. The word praise, spontaneous favorable judgment, extolling one verbally. The word stranger, an interesting word. It's a reference to an outsider in Israel, not a member of the tribes or the family. And observe that the proverb emphasizes the negative. Not is mentioned twice. It censors self-praise. Self-praise is the behavior of a fool. That's what the proverb tells us. Making our thinking one of futility believing that our gifts, our inner resources, uh, make us unique and special, which the Scripture says they absolutely and emphatically don't. Psalm 144 and verse 1, David praised God for his dexterity with his hands. He made my hands for war, my fingers for battle. When he stood against Goliath, he knew exactly in spinning that weapon over his head and through the snap of his wrist or the release of his fingers, just exactly when the velocity was of such that the projectile, the rock, would go right to the forehead of Goliath. And what does David do? He takes his gifts that he recognizes that God has given him. 
His agility, his skill. Psalm 18, I can leap over a wall. I can run. I am successful as an athlete in battle, he says. And he recognizes they're all gifts. They're gifts. And so what does he do? He turns around and he praises God for them. He doesn't keep them and say, this makes me special. This makes me unique. If you think about Psalm 144, verse 1, it's really just a step away from Romans chapter 12. The Apostle Paul's thought. We present our bodies as living sacrifices. That's adequate worship. That's complete worship. What do we do? We give ourselves back to Him in worship. So, He gave you skill and ability, uniqueness. You're good at it. And people tell you, you're really good at that. Praise God for it. Don't look at it and say, this makes me special, unique. That's what the world does. 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 12, King Saul set up a monument to himself, an outward expression of the inward rot that was going on in the man. I thought it was interesting that former FBI director James Comey, by his own admission in his book, A Higher Loyalty, declared that he had always and forever that he could remember, had struggled with his own self-importance. I quote the director, I can be stubborn, prideful, overconfident, and driven by ego. The proverb says, as a man thinks, so is he. And so, who influenced Mr. Comey the most? Was it father, mother? No, by his own admission. It was the liberal theologian Reinhold Niebuhr, died in 1971. Niebuhr didn't believe in verbal plenary inspiration, that each and every word of the Bible is God-breathed and fully authoritative for all righteousness and instruction and practicality. He didn't believe that. Reinhold Niebuhr taught us that the Garden of Eden was myth, not history. And now you figure it out. What do you think it means? Because you see, the Spirit of God is not the interpreter of the passage. It's you. What does it mean to you? What it means to you could be completely different from what it means to me. And then when it impresses itself upon me, then it becomes important and authoritative. The bottom line, it's not authoritative until my own interpretation is wrought upon it. That is utter and complete arrogance. Making man, man, Reinhold Niebuhr, you, me, we're the interpreter. We're the ones that figure it all out. It's not the Word of God. No. If I were talking to Mr. Comey, I would say to him, Sir, you need to go to the cross. That's where you need to go. You need to contemplate the cross where the God and the man together amalgamated into one person hung and died a very violent death, a death under the wrath of God Himself, His Father. Then, only then, do you really see yourself for what you really are. 
And what you really are is unlovable, unaffectionate, and in desperate need of the grace of God. Only there, and there only, can a person who contemplates Christ really destroy his pride. You're worth nothing. The right course is the one that the forerunner put us on. He spoke to us the greatest statement for man. He must increase, I must decrease. That's the great way to live. Now you found your gold nugget for life. That's prosperity. It's the death of self and onward for His glory. Here's three, the weight of a stone and the burden of sand. It's a better than proverb. The behavior of the fool, the irritation that he brings. The proverb declares it's an immense burden that is so immense that it physically can't even be lifted. That's this opening in the top line, the weight of a stone. It assumes that it's impossible to navigate. And line two, this sand is actually the sand on a beach. And here's your word. Genesis 22 and verse 17. God telling Abram, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as stars in the sky. And here's your word, sand on the seashore. Both the stars and the sand connote the idea of something immeasurable. Can't be calculated. Line two, but the vexation. Now your translation may have provocation. The King James translates it wrath. It's the word that's used by Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 6 of her rival, Paniah. She provoked her. That's a word. She provoked her. She irritated her. She vexed her because she was barren and Paniah was having all the children. What is the proverb saying? The will of the fool is unbearable in both quantity and quality. Woe to the woman who marries a fool. Here's verse 4. The cruelty of wrath and the torrents of anger. Our top line opens with two familiar concepts in the Old Testament. Wrath and anger. And they occur just like they are in the proverb 41 times in the Old Testament. Unrelentless, merciless, hard as flint, cruelty, that is these two words put together. They are a combustible pair. And the picture in the top line for a fool and for his behavior. This word torrents, very interesting. Seven occurrences of it in the Old Testament portraying an overwhelming force of destruction. We think of torrents of water cascading down a valley because a dam has broken and wiping out everything in its way. Here's an image of emotional rage. Irrational and violent is the person that is filled with wrath or anger together. And notice your contrast here. Line two, but anger, violence, as depicted in the top line, can be withstood. 
according to the proverb. You can live with it, but there's the strong contrast. However, as unpleasant as the wrath and anger are with an individual, jealousy, jealousy, according to the proverb, well, that's a category all unto itself. And that's the force. Let's think about that for a moment. It was the motivating factor of Cain killing his brother Abel. It was what drove the brothers to want to kill Joseph. Remember? And then only to sell him down to the Ishmaelites, to Egypt. And then it drove them to go back and tell their father that their son, their brother, would uh, have been killed by an animal. Not only telling that, they lived with a lie for over a decade. How powerful is jealousy? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us that it sends men out to preach the gospel, thinking that they make his way in prison much more difficult for doing so. That's jealousy. It is a sphere unto itself. The who in line two is rhetorical, asserting that no one can stand. Stand implies ability theologically in the Old Testament. That you have the strength to stand, which makes all the sense in the world in Psalm 1 and verse 6. For it says that the wicked will not be able to stand in the judgment. They have no ability. In the judgment, they're on their own. The righteous are covered. They have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the defender of the faithful. But the wicked, they're like in life on their own. And they'll be judged that way. On their own. A scary thought. That's standing. So when judgment is aroused, it falls back upon jealousy, which sweeps away, thinking again, Psalm 1, like the chaff that's blown by the wind. It sweeps men away. I thought about that. I set my alarm to the television, comes on my, my telephone at four in the morning. And it usually leads off with the top story and then the weather. I'm really interested in the weather. But the top story is invariably this. It's some former husband. It's a boyfriend who has now chased his wife, paramour, whoever, down and shoots them. Then he shoots himself. They found the body. And here's someone standing in the parking lot in darkness describing the scene for us. There it is. Jealousy. It's horrible. It sweeps people away. You don't think it would lead you to this, but it does. That's the point. Fight that natural tendency with all your heart. And that's the proverb. Here's five, open rebuke is better than concealed love, a better than proverb. Very short. But it's so interesting. Look, openness in correction is beneficial. Speaking out and taking action against wrong is far better than being silent. That's the proverb. This first word, open, is literally, it is... 
to reveal, to, to give information and balances the cancellation or the hidden. And that word is translated that way in Proverbs 22, 3. The prudent man sees danger and, here's your word, conceals or hides himself. Rebuke, King James. Reproof. Criticism, which the proverb declares is beneficial. Here it is, associated with love. Which makes sense because wisdom is always concerned about the best interest of other people. The concealed are happy or hidden. Love, in this proverb, is cowardly, timid. It doesn't no one any good. Parents fail with their children by not being aggressive in their correction. Fathers, here's the Proverbs. Fight passivity. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson said, you've got to understand one of his favorite quips. To live up here in Washington, you have to go along to get along. Well, that's not parenting. You don't go along to get along. You correct because you love the child and you want the child to bring you ultimate joy and peace and prosperity. And that comes from a carefully carved life of energy and influence and correction. It's love. Here's six. The wounds of a friend are faithful, but the kisses of an enemy are too excessive. Wounds and bruises are trustworthy because building off the last proverb, they inflict a good purpose in correction. Once again, it's the practice of a wise friend. And remember, Proverbs 17, 17, a wise friend is one who loves you always, unconditionally. He loves you. You may be wrong, but he's there for you, and he's there to help you. That's a friend. Now, look at the proverb itself. We're rather surprised. It has a secret surpri uh, surprise for us. The claim sounds self-contradictory. Do you see that? Look, line one, friendly matches wounds. Line two, kisses matches enemy. Isn't that interesting? So here, wounds, we would normally associate with an adversary, actually comes from a friend. While kisses, which symbolizes loving friendship, loyalty, actually, according to the proverb, comes from an enemy in hypocrisy. And of course, the perfect example of the proverb itself is Matthew chapter 26, verse 49. Jesus, standing in the darkness, was greeted by a kiss, remember? And going straightway to Jesus, Judas said, Hail, Rabbi, and kissed him. So, line one, these wounds are a figure for true friendship. In order to improve or to better the other person. Now line two, that but is a contrast with the same principle here. Kisses of an enemy. Enemy here is a word that denotes emotional detesting, abhorrence, despising another. 2 Samuel chapter 22, you have the Song of David, which is actually Psalm 18. 
in the Psalter. Not exactly the same, but for the most part, they're essentially the same. Now, 2 Samuel 22.41, here's what David says. You made my enemies turn their backs to me. Those who hated me and destroyed them. So, what a perfect parallel. Those who hated me are his enemies. That's what he declares. My enemies hated me. In parallel, one in the same. That's the idea. So we conclude the proverb with the excessive kisses, which is hypocrisy. To be profuse is the idea of the word. Multiplied, excessive, that's the word. It's found in Ezekiel chapter 35 and verse 13. And here's the way it's translated. You have boasted against me and your word. Multiplied. Multiplied your words. So it is not just one kiss. It is kissing you all over. Surrounding you with love. Seeming love. But it is deceitful love. It allows the enemy to hide himself from true contempt. Now, we move on to Proverbs chapter 27 and verse 9. Our next, olive oil and incense made the heart glad. It's another comparative proverb. Olive oil, incense, outward fragrances, one and the same with the wholesome counsel that is produced by friendship. The top line opens, olive oil and incense. What is that? Those are two expensive luxuries. They bring joy. They make the heart glad. Just like the wise son in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 10.1. The wise son brings joy, gladness, happiness to the parent. But the foolish son brings nothing but disaster, tears, heartache, heartbreak. Look at the, line, the and in line two. It seals the comparison. Those little connective words in the proverb. And so, so important. But the contrast, it helps you to see exactly the thought of the author and sets forth a beautiful roadmap. Here, likened to the sweetness a figure of delight, that's a true friend. Do you have a person in your life that's a true friend? The Apostle Paul wrote, I thank God for every remembrance of you. Do you have people like that in your life? That the moment you think of them, you thank God for them because He sent them to you along the way. Here's a picture of friendship. You see, true friends are those who are with you when nobody else is there. You know, they always say, you find out who your friends are in the crucible, in the fire. Well, try this one on. 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 4. Jonathan said to David, Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it for you. Do you know when he made that statement? You know when he told David that? 
He told David that when his life was worth about 100,000 shares of Enron. Nothing. That's when he told him that. He was a criminal. He was a nothing. And yet here he is, the son of the king. Whatever you want me to do, I am here for you. Look at this closing of line two. Passionate counsel. Counsel of the Spirit. I've said this before. I remind you again. This is from the Proverbs. True friendship is not common experiences. You know, well, we fought in the war together. I've always known Charlie. Yes, but Charlie is your acquaintance. He's not your best friend. You have common experiences. But that's not true friendship. Here's true friendship. True friendship is forged in common beliefs. What you believe is what I believe. And because I believe what you believe, we have a bond that goes beyond personal experience. That's why you have martyrs that are willing to die for the Savior that they've never really met. But they believe in one another. And they are His true friends. Spirit here in the Old Testament is the center of one's heart. Passion, drives, appetites, they all come from the heart but they are meted out of your life by the Spirit. Now this is what I think is interesting about the body of Christ. We are all diverse. We are a diverse group of people. All different. And yet, all held together. Amalgamated together. Into one. Father, I pray, said the Lord Jesus, that they may be one. But we're different. And here's the way that manifests itself and the beautiful way that ministry occurs in the body of Christ. The very things that touch you make you weep don't affect me at all. Why, that doesn't reach me. But then the very things that reach me, you say, well, that doesn't affect me at all. See, we're all different. We all come from different backgrounds, different places. But we are all one together. And therefore, we can effectively minister to one another. See this passionate counsel? That's a word of a friend. That friend knows you. That friend values you. And that friend can speak to you in earnest about the very things that you two hold in common. That's ministry. And that's friendship. It traverses ordinary relationships. It traverses time. What did I possibly, as a young man in my early 30s, have in common with a surgeon like Charles Howard? Nothing. But everything. Because his passion was my passion. Christ. Christ and His Word. So on that basis, we are friends. And as a result of our friendship, we minister to one another. Here's our final proverb. This is an interesting one. I've always contemplated this, but only until I studied it out did I really see it for what it was. It's an interpretive question. 
as for the one who blesses his neighbor with a loud voice early in the morning. The proverb has to do with communication, specifically saying the right thing at the right time. Notice the top line. The activity is happening to a neighbor. And you see that? Who's a neighbor? From the book of Proverbs, the neighbor's the man on the street, remember? Not a family member, not a friend, a third party. And therefore, that third party doesn't know the speaker at all. It's rather random. This word blesses, it's emphatic. So let me give it to you emphatically so you'll see it. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 54 and 55. Solomon had finished praying. He got up from the altar and went where he had been kneeling, and with his hands spread to heaven like this, he stood and blessed. There it is emphatically. He blessed the entire congregation, the assembly in Israel, with a loud voice. That's your word. So our top line reads, this one or person is doing one and the same in a loud voice. And notice the time. Early, literally time of rising, daybreak, and here's your word. It's found in Genesis 22 and verse 3. Early in the morning. That's how your Bible reads. Early in the morning. That's our word right here. Abram got up, loaded his donkey, took two of his servants, and headed for the mountain of God with Isaac. Line two. Now, notice the word reckoned. It's important in interpreting the proverb. The interpreter is the neighbor, and he reckons. That word reckon is found in Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 28. Let me give it to you. Even a fool, if he remains quiet, is reckoned to be wise. What does reckon teach us? That it is a quick interpretation. We don't know if he's a fool or not. But we interpret him to be a wise person on first glance because he keeps silent. We reckon it that way at first blush. So what is this proverb telling us about communication? Right place, right time, speaking with sincerity, speaking with an earnest attitude. That's what this is all about. I love the comment of the Cambridge scholar Derek Kidner in reference to these words of our proverb. Here's what he says. It matters not only what we say, but how we say, when and why and where we say. Take the proverb as a warning. When people don't know you, they're neighbors. Be very careful how you project yourself. People are always evaluating you. And they're evaluating you instantly, reckoning by what they see and by what they hear. They don't know you, so you must project to reach them. Project in kindness, in warmth, and then you'll be wise. And that's the proverb. Let's close. Thank you, Father, for our time to study this morning. We're so grateful for the Word of God that counsels us 
each and every day to teach us the skill for living. This skill is beyond human capacity. Men don't know it, can't know it. But here is the right way to live. So by the power of the Holy Spirit, incorporate this into our lives. It's the Word, and we believe it. And by believing it, we act upon it. And we do that now in the powerful name of our Savior, our Master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.